Today, we check in, see how I'm doing on the end of week three. Also, we talk about what life is like in the food desert and how we can circumvent those mirages we find. All that, and I'm joined by my friend, my cohort, my creative partner. This is the person I go to to double check my idiocy, which is vast. It's my buddy, Johnny Blues It. Hey, everybody. I want to thank John to start because uh, we're still feeling out my process, still working on this podcast, still trying to figure out how to talk into a microphone because it's a lot more challenging than you might think. Yeah, hey, but we're talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart and stomach. Well, it's important that it's near to your stomach. So to start, this is the end of my third week getting back onto my program. So first, my weight this week was 246 pounds, 0.4, which is a drop of 2.4 pounds in a week. So that's good. I was deathly ill this week. Last week, I sounded like I was a dying frog, and I was a mostly dead frog for the majority of this week. So I didn't work out. I didn't walk. I mostly coughed and made myself soup and would vary between those two activities repeatedly. And maybe you can turn it into an active soup making if you get yourself a 50 pound cast iron ladle. You see, I need that kind of like feedback because it didn't occur to me that I could have taken the act of cooking and made it cardio and also made it strength building. Could you imagine the forearms, how much they would have popped? Indeed. Ugh. Anyway, most cooking skills should not be very much combined with gladiatorial combat. Ideally. Ideally, but it, but if you have to, cast iron 50 pound ladles are the way to go. That's what in the Middle Ages we used to call a mace. <laughs> I don't get to talk to John that often. I'm just really excited he's here. <laughs> I'm really happy to have a friend. Yeah, hey, I'm glad to be here. But anyway, I believe you were going to do an intro. You said you were losing two pounds this week, which uh, actually two pounds a week is about what they say one ought to shoot for. You know, as you're first starting to lose weight, especially when you're doing what I'm doing, which is keto, your body is sort of recomposing itself. I'm losing a lot of water weight. Hell, <laughs> how close the moon is to the planet affects the weight because the weight is imprecise. So you really shouldn't take weights as if they're set in stone or gospel. They're just an indicator. So if your weight goes up a little one week or it goes down one week, that doesn't really matter. It's the trend over a long period of time. That that's that's what you're shooting for. It's nice that it's down two point four pounds. I'm very happy. Yeah, I mean water weighs eight pounds per gallon, right? So you drink a big glass of water and your weight goes up by two pounds. So yeah, your weight's gonna bounce around a bit. If you're trying to get an accurate gauge of your weight, what I recommend is choose a day, as soon as you wake up, go to the bathroom, weigh yourself. And do that each time you weigh yourself. That way it's your morning dry weight. You have not added anything into your body. And by doing the same practice, you're at least providing the same circumstance to get it as internally accurate as humanly possible. Little tip on weighing yourself, if you are so inclined. If you don't want to weigh yourself, your clothes will tell you how you're doing. Yeah, I've got a wee bitty update for you. After six months, my dry weight's down to 153. Uh, like a lot of people, I'd put on the pandemic 15. And I realize that sounds like a joke to a lot of people who have a lot more weight than that to lose, but I'm a small guy and very short. So for me, 15 pounds is, it's actually a pretty big percentage of my weight. It is. Yeah, and my blood work had gone all to hell because of it. And I knew this was going to happen. It's the pandemic. The greater virtue was not to go to the grocery store if you can avoid it. So you have to eat what you can get delivered and not be too persnickety. And, you know, it's the freaking end of the world. So I'm buttering my freaking toast, you know. <laughs> so I knew this was going to happen. And I told the doctor, hey, look, just give me six months to train and do my blood work again. And, you know, I don't think I need to go on medication. And sure enough, I don't. So I'm happy about that. You know, that brings us to a good point. So I... Well, first off, congratulations to you. You are a small guy. And for you, that 15 pound weight fluctuation for somebody who's like five foot 10 is kind of more like a 25, 30 pound weight fluctuation. So in all fairness there, but I do keto. So my dietary parameters are different than what yours are. I would like you to talk a little bit about, well, first off, how do you eat? What is your diet? Well, my diet is... I don't really want to call it the Mediterranean diet because I am, in fact, Mediterranean. So it's what my people just call eating. Right. Um, but, but let's assume that the people you're talking to aren't your people and for the most part would probably chase you with picked forks. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so, yeah, the Mediterranean diet is kind of the stuff we all know. It's the hummus and tabbouleh and lots of salads. 
And in the Middle East, they don't tend to use a lot of meat in their cooking, mainly because it's expensive in that part of the world, not for philosophical reasons. So every meal tends to be a piece of lean protein, maybe the size of my palm, and then a lot of salads of various kinds, vegetables, and like slow-burning carbohydrates like black beans, garbanzos, that sort of thing. Mediterranean people do have a couple of awful habits, though, that I've had to sort of remove from the diet. They eat way too much bread and cheese, which I don't eat any of either. Breaks the heart, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. You know, bread and cheese are some of my favorite things. Uh, butter also has to be removed. My father uh, grew up in Istanbul. Not Constantinople. Not Constantinople, no. But a terrible habit that the Turks have in particular is after dinner, the nuts and the dried fruit come out, and that'll go on for, you know, for hours. And dried fruit in particular is uh, very dense with sugars and very laden with calories. So this is something you really shouldn't do, and I don't. And actually, I've had to curtail my fruit intake altogether, because while they say fruit is good for you, and it is, it is laden with a lot of fructose, which is a monoglyceride, and so I've had to curtail that. I'm glad you mentioned the whole fructose thing, because it's been on my mind a lot. I've been thinking about the standard Western diet, but specifically fructose. Every cell in your body can run off of glucose. Your body knows how to utilize that. We are adapted to not actually be able to burn the fructose. The only thing we can do with fructose is it goes to the liver and our liver converts it into a different form of energy that it can use. And when your body is already inundated with glucose, it just immediately streamlines the fructose to fat. That was a biological adaptation we have because when we were hunter-gatherers, you didn't find fruit that often. So when we found fruit, we would eat as much of it as humanly possible because we also couldn't store it or take it anywhere. And we would store that as fat. So your body doesn't use fructose for anything other than really creating fat. Certainly not within the realm of the modern Western diet. I just wanted to touch on that because if you were wondering why you feel like that going shopping and the food you eat might be stacked against you and you might have this loss of control and that something is wrong, it's not you. It's that everything's got high fructose corn syrup in it. Yes. And that is custom built to become fat in your body. That makes sense. It's like another thing that I'm really trying to do is just eat three squares a day without snacking in between meals and to eat dinner fairly early, like at 6 p.m. and then be done eating for the day, like not be eating before I go to bed. That makes a lot of sense. Do you find yourself using the intermittent fasting philosophy or you just kind of like fell into a pattern? There was no intention behind it. There wasn't really that much of an intention behind it, except that, you know, grandma used to say, don't eat between meals and don't eat at night. And I have read studies that say that people who snack between meals do eat smaller meals, but it's not enough smaller to make up for the snacking. So I don't really didn't have that much weight to lose, so I don't feel like I need to compress my eating into a six-hour window necessarily. But I would like to keep it within a 12-hour window. It's like when dinner is over at 6.30, I want to be done for the day. I've also read that your body releases growth hormone when you sleep, and it's not capable of releasing growth hormone and insulin at the same time. And if you make it choose one, it's going to choose insulin because that's more critical. So if you're trying to build muscle, you're going to have a harder time doing it if you eat before you go to bed. So I try not to do that. It's not just building muscle. There's a wide variety of body repair processes going on that gets disrupted when you don't release your human growth hormone. Another reason that snacking is a little bit of a problem is weight gain is an insulin issue. And whenever you're taking in food, you're releasing insulin. If you're eating what most snack foods do, it's spiking your insulin level. So instead of you having an insulin reaction three times a day, you're having it six times a day or eight times a day. Maybe you drink sweetened drinks and then it's even more than that. You know, when I'm off program and I'm freewheeling it, I probably am having anywhere from 12 to 20 insulin spikes during the day because the little bit of candy you might grab in the office, that's an insulin spike. Go to Starbucks, you have a Frappuccino, it has some sugar in it, maybe not a lot, but there's still some of it. That's an insulin spike. Yeah, that makes sense. And that creates insulin insensitivity, which is a major driver of obesity. Sure. So you want to uh, obviously eat your calories, don't drink them, like drink water, drink unsweetened tea, unsweetened coffee, which actually is a habit I kind of picked up off the old man because he was a bit of a tough guy. And in his era, like tough guys in Istanbul took their coffee black and their whiskey straight. Alcohol is another habit that I've really curtailed. Like I used to like to have a shot, you know, of uh, 
whiskey after dinner, but that disrupts my sleep, and I've had to curtail that because alcohol, as you know, turns to sugar. It's also a neurotoxin. Well, there is that. And rice, especially white rice, is another thing you want to kind of curtail. For the same reason as the bread, the glycemic index is a bit high. Although bread has an additional problem, which is wheat is actually in the grass family, and we're not very well adapted to eating it. And it does cause a histamine reaction in pretty much everybody some degree of inflammation. So there are people who tolerate it, but I don't think there's anybody who really thrives on it. You know, it's better to avoid it. Yeah, God, it's such a heartbreaking thing. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It's funny. I'm doing keto, so I'm ostensibly avoiding as much carbohydrates as possible. Certainly no breads, though the one crutch food that I've really been using are these low-carb tortillas. And I try to use as little as possible. And actually this week, once I use up what I have, I'm going to try to dump them. But when I'm on the diet, it's not ice cream and it's not candy bars or chocolate or any of those things that really pull at me and pull me off. What it is that eventually causes me to break when and if I do break is bread or white rice. Those two things more than anything else kill me. And it's funny because I am, as I've said before, I am a professionally trained comfort eater. I can out eat almost anybody. There are people who are better but it's going to be a race and it's going to kill somebody in the long run, mostly through coronary heart disease. And it's probably going to be me. Um, oh God. But I'm on keto and the chocolate bars are sort of like, ah, oh, I miss chocolate, but I can sort of fudge something up if I need to pardon the pun, but bread, it's like a nice loaf of French bread. And it might as well have a sharpened metal point on it to stab me in the heart. Well, personally, I do the cheat day thing. And be forewarned, I've also read, and I don't know how reliable these sources are, you have to do your own double checking, but I've read that doing cheat day can be a dangerous thing to do if you're on keto. But what I'm doing is not a low-carb diet, it's merely a slow-carb diet. Um, and so I do the cheat day thing, and I've heard two theories about cheat day, and I don't know which one is true. Some people say that having one high-calorie day stops your body going into starvation mode and downshifting your metabolism to try to save energy. Uh, and then other people say, well, it's, that's not true at all. It's just purely psychological. And I don't know what the truth is, but I do know that the psychological part of it, at least for me, is very real. And it's like, I know I'm going to have a breakdown. And by scheduling the breakdown in advance for a particular day, then it kind of takes the failure out of it. And I can like get the pancakes out of my system and then get, get on with the program. I've tried doing cheat day. And the thing is, I am psychologically not well suited to it. I'm an all or nothing kind of guy. So... I can stick on what I'm doing, and as long as I'm sticking to it, I'm fine. The moment I start trying to give myself a little bit of a escape valve, it just goes to hell. It just mm. falls apart. So now you're right about keto. Keto doesn't allow for the cheat days in the way other diets might. Once you get fully adapted, once you've been doing it for a long period of time and you become a bit metabolically flexible, then you can have the occasional cheat. I wouldn't even do a full cheat day. It would be a cheat meal, and it is going to affect your insulin level. But having been in keto for a long period of time, you'll sort of ride it out. You'll be fine. The longer you do keto, the more degree of flexibility you have, but it's a very finite degree of flexibility. Now, I'm actually confronted with this issue coming up in about two weeks. Liz's birthday. We're going away. We're going to go out and have a really nice dinner. We've not gone out and had a really nice dinner in 18 months. I will be off program for that meal. It's her birthday. I cannot do that to her. It's like, it's like after my mother had passed away and my cousin invited us over for dinner and I was doing keto and I was like really, really hardcore. I hadn't broken in months. And he's like, hey, I'm going to be making pasta. I'm going to be making this. I'm going to be making that. And I'm on the phone going, I do. I love pasta. That's great. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> I'll bring dessert. I've got to find a cake. I couldn't go like you can do that, but then you're that weird person everybody doesn't like because for that one moment in time, you couldn't get your head out of your own ass. Yeah, and I'm guessing that uh, giving Liz a pile of meat with a candle in it wouldn't go over too well. I've been doing a lot of production stuff. And when I'm up till one in the morning, I don't go up to bed because of the dogs and I don't want to interrupt life. So I'm already sleeping on the couch enough from time to time. I don't need to add more of that in. Liz, my media shy girlfriend, whom is the light of my heart. I love you. And I would understand if I brought you a pile of meat with a candle, how 
we may no longer be a couple. I could see how that would, <laughs> I, I could see how that would be the end of all things. And you would be in the right as you often are. Now, don't let her know that I said that because I'm a bit of a know-it-all and that's my thing. And if I admit that she's more right than I am, that would just totally throw off the balance of our relationship. So I'll protect your secret with my life. Please. It's not like I'm putting this out on public airwaves or anything. <laughs> Damn, I miss you, buddy. God, <laughs> I hate the fact that you live across the country. So aside from the fact that I love this guy and he's a really good artist, which has nothing to do with this podcast whatsoever, but he did make the logo. I wanted to talk to you about what I would like to call the modern food desert. The problems we have in simply finding quality food. The nature of agriculture has changed vastly in the past hundred years. And it's created a lot of modern problems, part of which is that fructose issue we talked about before around, was it around the 70s or the 80s? I'm not exactly sure of the time frame when everything shifted to fat, bad, low fat, good. Well, they took the fat out of the diet and they replaced it with something. And it was sugar because you take fat out and things taste like ass and you need to compensate for that. And they added more sugar, and then they developed this wonderful thing called high fructose corn syrup, and then our waistbands were really off to the races. So, John, you live in Boston, and you are also somebody who has had long commutes to work. You've had basically the same issue that most modern working people do with their diets. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, because we've talked about this before, and I found you to have a very interesting take on the modern American culinary landscape. Yeah, I mean, back when I was a motorcycle enthusiast riding across the country, I've literally gone for 150 miles and not seen anything to eat that isn't junk food. And even if you're going out to eat in restaurants a lot, I think cooking is really integral to the success of any kind of diet. If you don't cook, you're just not going to make it. I was at a Japanese steakhouse once and I thought, well, you know, okay, we're doing pretty good here. I mean, it's meat, it's vegetables, it's on the grill, you know, what can be bad? And then the chef comes out and he's got this gigantic brick of margarine, this big glisten, not even butter, this glistening yellow oleaginous, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> it's very, very bright in color though. Not like when you get like a really good rich butter, it's got that nice yellow tone and it's like, ah, uh, there's, there's heaven on a plate. The margarine has... Yeah, like a two-year-old that drew a stick of butter with Crayolas or something. And so the, the chef hogs off a big slab of this off the end of the brick, and he dumps it right in the vegetables. And it's like, okay, that's why we're not uh, losing any weight eating hibachi. And, uh, you know, then I was watching a cooking show. I forget which one it was, but the chef was cooking a slab of bacon like the size of your thigh in the oven. And he had a pan underneath it to catch the drippings. And he said, oh, I'm going to use the drippings in the salad dressing. And it's like, yeah. So if you're going out to restaurants and ordering the salad all the time and you're wondering why you're not losing any weight, you know, maybe it's because you're eating 800 calories of salad dressing. So it becomes pretty clear that, that you have to cook. You really do. And in a major city, like I live in Metro Boston, and so I know the city and I know there are places that I can pit stop and get something that's nutritionally sound. But that's really a privilege. You know, it's like, look, most places don't have that. And it costs a lot of money to do that. You know, if you can afford to keep pit stopping in at these places, you're, you know, I'm privileged. I understand how that is, too, because most of my shopping is done out of Whole Foods, not because I like to have my pinky out when I shop. I want to be assured of the quality of the meats that I'm buying because I do eat quite a bit in the way of meats and I want it to be grass fed. Not again, not because my pinky is out. But because the difference between a grass-fed cut of meat versus one that came off of a feedlot, the feedlot is fed with corn. And corn introduces a whole lot of health issues to the meat and changes the entire composition of the fat. So even with like a fatty cut of meat from a grass-fed cow versus a feedlot cow, the amino acids, the fatty acids are entirely different. And it is a lot healthier to go with the grass-fed the way cows were meant to eat as opposed to corn, which they are not really um, adapted to. Yeah. And if you just pit stop in at some random restaurant, do you think you're eating grass fed beef or do you think you're eating two buck chuck? So to really um, get anywhere with your health journey, cooking is going to have to be a part of your life. And if you live with somebody, your partner is really going to have to be on board with it. 
And your partner is really going to have to be on board with not keeping junk food in the house, because if there's junk food in the house, you're going to pick away at it. This is a critical tip. So if you're out there and you're trying to get your fitness on track, your partner has to be on board. They have to be supportive and they have to be understanding. If your partner, if the person you live with is putting obstacles in your way or indeed creating active hazards, such as you're not even trying to do any particular diet, but you're cutting out snack food and they're bringing cookies in, you're going to lose that battle. Your partner has to understand while you understand they still might want to eat cookies. There is a world outside that is not the house where they can get cookies. Cookies don't have to be in the house. If your partner doesn't have the degree of understanding that staring at Oreos 24-7 is going to break you, and that doesn't matter to them, you're not going to succeed at your dietary goals. Yeah, I think willpower is a finite resource, like a bag full of marbles. Mm -hmm. And every time you use it, you take a marble out of the bag. And when the bag is empty, you're out of willpower. So you really have to set up your environment to eliminate the need for willpower as much as you can. And I have some compulsive behaviors, which are hard to explain. It's not really an addiction because addictions are more focused, but my compulsion is free floating and it'll settle on whatever's available. So if there's like chocolate in the house, I'll just keep going back to the kitchen for it. And if we have a bottle of whiskey here, you know, I won't finish it in a day, but I'll finish it in a couple of days. And if it's not here, like the compulsion isn't strong enough to get me to leave and go down to the store and get it. But if it's just sitting in the kitchen, the compulsion is strong enough to have me just going back and forth to the kitchen like a lemming. So I really have to not have that stuff here. Oh, you see, I'm a little worse than you at that. I will go out. I will get in the car and go out to five different places to get exactly what I want. So if the stuff were here, I'm dead. Yeah, yeah. And like if your partner is one of these lucky people, you know, and she can eat whatever she wants and never gain an ounce, whereas I gain weight just smelling French fries. And she says, well, look, I don't have a problem with this. I don't, you know, know why I need to suffer. It's like what you said is right. It's like, look, you can go out and just get a bag of French fries and finish them. Like you don't have to have them here. Like there are bakeries where you can go, even a supermarket have bakeries very often where you can go and get a cookie and finish it and be done with it. Like you don't have to bring a box of them home. This isn't a relationship podcast, but there's something to be said about somebody having that lack of empathy. It's a little more understandable that your home environment might be a little more of a minefield when there's an entire family in the process. But if it's just you and one other person, or hell, even if the person doesn't live with you, but every time you go out somewhere, they're trying to stuff you full of the latest and greatest, and you don't seem to get the idea, it's time for some conversations. Fair enough. Yeah. And since it's not a relationship podcast, I guess we'll leave it at that. When you talk about the necessity of cooking, the landscape has really changed over the last 40, 50 years. Historically, in a household, there was usually a dedicated person to running the household. Now, traditionally, that role was the mother's role. I just want to be clear about this. This is in no way, shape or form to talk about the role of women in society. That's not the point. I am all for everybody doing whatever they want, however they want to do it. But there still was the role of the person who cared for the home. And that person, for the most part, cooked. Before World War II, we didn't even really have much in the way of prepared food. There had been during World War I, and, and canning started in the late 1800s, but it was World War II that really brought home the necessity to have canned meals, and it created the start of an industry that grew. Right. The technology for the MREs for the soldiers got repurposed for processed foods at home, basically. An industry grew up. And once the war went away, the purpose for the industry went away. But there was this profitable industry and it shifted. Having food readily available removed starvation, which was a reality of our country up until the mid 20th century. That's a good thing. Yeah, right. And then when the one uh, income households became two income households because of societal changes and economic realities, then the technology was repurposed for, hey, we don't actually have time to cook. So let's just get TV dinners. Yes. And also there was an entire educational process going on. We had home economics. Home economics went away shortly after we left school. In home economics, they taught skills like balancing checkbooks, how to cook, how to shop. We had to bake and we had to do things. It was a starter amount of skill for cooking and baking. It kind of at least made it somewhat normalized that you would cook. That 
went away, I think, for the millennials. I think so. There's certainly no home economic classes now. And that's a vital skill that you don't have. So you mix that with two income households and a de-emphasization of the home cook and the proliferation of fast food and convenience food. And even in the store, when you go shopping, the amount of frozen meals that you can pick up and packaged meals are staggering. So even when you're cooking, you're not cooking. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, the good news is that should you decide to explore cooking, uh, if you're in a relationship, it can actually be a very good relationship thing. Like, I don't think it would be any exaggeration to say that cooking is like the cornerstone of me and Hootie's relationship. So it's become a thing, and having two people to do the work really helps make it tenable. And so if you live alone, you're going to be up against the time problem of how do you do this in a way that's not just swallowing your entire life. It is really hard to work a full-time job because it's not just your eight-hour job. Right. It's the act of getting to and from. So you've spent 12 hours working, and you get home. And now you have to start cooking, especially if you're by yourself and there's not someone to share the task with. That just becomes packaged dinner or ordering takeout. Well, even with two people, you bump up against that to some degree. So cookbooks can be broadly categorized into artsy and practical. And we tend to gravitate to the practical ones for working adults and stay away from the ones for aspiring chefs. Why don't you name one or two of the foundational cookbooks that have helped you? Because I'm sure... There's somebody out here listening going, I would like to start cooking for myself, but I don't really know where to start. Where did you start? What are these books? Well, where I started, I was given a book by a chef named Sandra Lee called Semi Homemade. And it was a book that seeks to save time by starting with prepared foods as a base and then adding your own stuff on top of that. And there's a lot of stuff in that book you're not going to want to make if you're trying to lose weight, but there is a specifically healthy food chapter. And that's what really got me started. And uh, like crock pot cooking is a big thing for us, for example, because although it's a slow cooker, it tends itself. You don't have to sit there and tend it. And you can get these big, like three or four quart Tupperware tubs and put all of the ingredients in the tub and put them in the refrigerator. So you don't have to necessarily cook it the same day you put it all together. And then in the morning, you can just pull one of these things out, dump it in the crock pot and come home at night and you have dinner. And if you do two or three different crock pot things, you can then take the portions and freeze them in single portion Tupperwares and put them in the freezer. You know, if you do this on Sunday for the rest of the week or maybe even two weeks, you have two or different, three different kinds of meals you can just pop out and defrost. The crock pot can be an amazing tool for somebody just trying to cook at home. For the amount of effort you put into it, the amount of food you get out of it is vast. So you're an individual, you have a crock pot. The crock pot is, let's say it's a six quart crock pot, six quarts of food. You throw things in there, you put the lid on, you set it for 12, 15 hours, you go away. When you come home, first off, the house is a delight to walk into because just the smells. Nothing fills your house with the smell of deliciosity, quite like a crock pot. Nothing does it. So the house just is permeated with this smell. It, it's a reward. It's a, it's a reward for your soul that costs you nothing because you've already set the crock pot. You spent five minutes that morning setting yourself up and then you've got eight meals out of it. You bring the poetry of a lover <laughs> to the description of the smell of cooking. That's what you need to get through life. <laughs> <laughs> I have a high school buddy, I think you may have met him, uh, named Chris, that when he was younger, he was a long haul trucker, uh, used to drive a big rig. And whereas most truckers will tend to put on weight from eating at, you know, uh, greasy spoons at truck stops, Chris was actually in the best shape of his life. And the reason was because he had a little refrigerator and a little microwave in the truck that ran off truck power. And on Sundays when he was home, he would just fill up the refrigerator and each meal was portioned out with so much carbs, so much protein, so much fat. He controlled exactly what he was eating. Worked out very well. So you'd be doing pretty much the same thing. The microwave is an underused and much maligned tool. The microwave can save you a lot of time and the food that comes out of it doesn't have to taste like rubber. It's just that you need to study microwave cookery. Like the microwave has quirks. It's not like a conventional oven. Its behavior is different and you have to work around what it does. I make the eggs every single morning in the microwave and they don't come out like rubber at all. 
One thing, a little side detour, but I think it's worth taking, is I used to work with a guy who firmly believed and told me so that cooking with a microwave kills the cells in your food, and so you might as well throw your food in the trash can for all the good it's going to do you. Your food is dead. So I went online looking for some corroboration of this, and I found an article at the Harvard School of Medicine. And the Harvard School of Medicine says that your digestive system works actually by taking things apart for their raw materials. Mm -hmm. So if your food isn't dead, it's going to be dead shortly after it hits your stomach acid, and that whole thing is a red herring. The cooking method that preserves the most nutrition is the one that uses the least time and the least water. It's absolutely not necessary for the cells in the food to be alive. So you have to choose to believe somebody, and you can believe some crank on the internet, but I choose to believe the Harvard School of Medicine. It's not the Toxic Avenger. You're not eating irradiated food. That is an urban myth. That is science fear. Yeah. Microwaves are safe. Your food may suck because you don't know how to use yours, but that's an entirely different subject. If you microwave your food in a bowl uh, at lower power, like you say, and also put a plate on top of it to act as a lid, it makes kind of a Dutch oven and that keeps the moisture in it circulating, prevents it drying out so much. Yeah, it's partially steaming the food. Yeah. But you mentioned lunchboxing and that is another thing. You're right. It's like, it seems to me uh, when I was a kid, grade schooler, I p you used to see people walking around with brown bags and lunchboxes a lot more than you do now. And lunchboxing seems to be kind of a dying art. If you're taking a day trip into a major city and you live in a major city and you can afford to pit stop at these places you know are healthy, great. But if not, maybe it's time to revive the lost art of lunchboxing. The shame of it is, is that in a lot of places, finding good food, and by good food, I mean just things that aren't processed or fast food, is really difficult. It's not just, it's, it's a problem of economics, the problem of how agriculture shifted in the past 50 years, how farmers were subsidized changed around the 50s and 60s. And that's where all the emphasis went on cereal grains, namely corn and soybeans. The entire structure of our food supply chain shifted towards the usage of corn and soybeans. So now it's very difficult to get good vegetables because farmers aren't subsidized or paid for good vegetables. They're subsidized and paid for corn. Right. And by the way, if only we were eating corn and soybeans, because it's like, yeah, corn is starch, but when you eat it off the cob, it's not all that digestible. So whatever it is and whatever it ain't, it's not that big a deal. We're eating like processed stuff that's made out of ground up corn, which is for all practical purposes, pre-digested for you. It's not just ground up. There's, there's tons of different processes. But back onto the lunchboxing though, if you're not traveling by subway like Hootie and I are, if you're traveling by car, which is the case for most people, well, man, you're golden because you can just throw a cooler in the trunk and, you know, throw some ice packs in there. Actually, you and I did that once on a road yes. trip before we left. You cooked a bunch of meals and there were a bunch of Tupperwares in the cooler. I mean, it was a little weird, like microwaving a container of beef stew for breakfast. But I mean, nutritionally, it was a way better choice than anything we were going to get on the road. It also made the traveling a lot more economical for us because that beef stew might have cost me $12, $14 to make. And we got 16 servings out of it. Yeah, and the fact that you cook like a boss doesn't hurt either. 16 servings, eight meals each. Our road trip was eight days, nine days. That was one meal. That was one meal. That was what would have been, if we went to a restaurant and we ate, that would have been anywhere from 10 to $20. If it's me, I'm, I'm hitting the $20 because I'm customizing my meal to make it how I want it. And I'm paying the price for it, which is why I'm poor. Where, you know, you, you'd go kind of more basic. We would have spent about 30 to $40 per meal. And we did for dinners. It used to be, it was kind of breakfast, lunch, and then dinner was at a restaurant somewhere. Yeah, that's actually another Western habit, which isn't all that great, which is the big dinners. In the Middle East, actually, lunch is the big meal of the day. Dinners are rather small, and that's a better habit if you can get used to it. The other thing that a lot of Americans tend not to do is not to drink nearly enough water. I'm guilty. We're not going to tell you how many cups of water to drink because apparently nobody knows. Drink what's right for you, but try to drink water. And I'm saying this more to me than anybody else because I'm exceptionally bad at it to the point where just me saying this makes me a hypocrite and my nose should just be growing to the camera lens even as we speak. But I'm trying to get better at it. Yeah, but it's good for you. Fish have sex in that. Maybe some of that will rub off. Mm-hmm. Fish sex and rubbing off. That is definitely... <laughs> that is definitely... 
in making the pitch to drink more water, I think you found the magic keys that we needed to just set this into everybody's mind and make it okay. Will this make it through the editing? <laughs> no. That's your bets. Oh, no, this is definitely making it through the editing. <laughs> it's important to remember that if you're somebody who never really learned how to cook, somebody who never really wanted to cook, you would be surprised at how much better the food you make, even with somewhat subpar ingredients, like the tomatoes down at your local grocery store aren't the most flavorable things you're going to ever encounter. They've been bred for portability and shelf life, and their flavor has taken a hit because of that. However, versus a frozen meal, it's still orders of magnitude better. But the point is, like, don't give up the first time you botch something. You know, cooking is a learning curve like everything. You have to stick at it, and eventually you'll get better at it. More than even most skills, the benefits to becoming even just passable with cooking far outweigh the efforts. If you can learn to cook for yourself and you learn like a great skill, one of the most important skills is seasoning. Because there's no hard and fast rule, seasoning is all about your taste, how much salt you need to give to get that balance of being flavorful. I particularly like a little bit of salt and doing keto, I need salt because I'm not getting it from normal sources that other people are getting it from. I need to supplement that. So I use a nice amount of salt in my cooking. But when you figure these things out, suddenly just making yourself eggs, it's so much better than anywhere else. So it's skills well worth developing. And they're a lot easier than you think they are. Yeah, absolutely. They really are. Now, speaking of scrambling things up, here are my weekly goals. So having been near death for the past week, I didn't work out prior. So I'm still stuck after like four podcasts, three weeks in. I still want to get my same thing. Three days, three miles of walking that is specifically dedicated to walking the three miles. Not, hey, at the end of the day, I got three miles of walking. Look at me going around Costco. Three days of doing my workout routine. That's the goal. I also may or may not, depending on the weather, because when the weather is wet and currently we're going through the rainy season here in Los Angeles, I want to pull out my pads and start practicing some of my forward and back rolls and some of my stunt falls. I'm going to stick keto. I'm going to try to cut out, not try, as a wise puppet once said, try not, do or do not. So I plan to do do the do do that I do, which is to get rid of the low carb tortillas. That is my goal for the week. Now, John, again, I miss you terribly. You're one of my closest friends. You're across the country. You're in Boston. As somebody who drives around Los Angeles, I'm afraid of the roads in Boston. Oh, man. Every, every road is shaped like a corkscrew and they're all one way going the wrong way. Like you can see where you want to go and you just can't get there. That's why I take the subway. But, you know, I've brought you on and I've talked about all this diet stuff. Who are you? What the hell do you do? And where can people find you if they're not finding you here? Well, as it happens, I do have something interesting coming up to plug. I'm an artist, among many other things, uh, and I have a monster book coming out of all things. <laughs> what is a monster book, you say? It's a book of monsters. Actually, yes. You're aware, I'm sure, and most of our listeners are, too, probably aware of Dungeons & Dragons, but uh, what you may not be aware of is there's like a bajillion tabletop role-playing games in every genre you can think of, and a bajillion indie pictures putting out supplemental material for all these games. And one of these games is a Swedish game called Merk Borg, uh, which is kind of an art book disguised as a game. And it's got a very sort of 80s Swedish death metal photocopy fanzine aesthetic. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, man, this is right in my sweet spot. Uh, so I went through all my old sketchbooks and took all of my monster doodles because I tend to draw monsters when I'm bored and I don't know what to draw and kind of wrote them up as monsters for the game. It got a very positive reception on the Merkborg Discord and it attracted the attention of a publisher called Exalted Funeral. Uh, so my monster book for Merkborg is going to be coming out on Exalted Funeral shortly. Uh, we hope to get it out by Black Friday. And that's exaltedfuneral.com, correct? Yes. Yeah, if you Google for Exalted Funeral, you'll definitely find them. And I'm Bluzit pretty much everywhere, B-L-O-O-Z-I-T. Uh, nine of these monsters are available for free download on itch.io. And I'm Bluzit on itch. I'm, you know, Bluzit on Instagram. My Behance portfolio is up on under Bluzit. 
So if during the 80s, you didn't manage to lose your soul to the devil playing Dungeons and Dragons, again, you've got another opportunity to court the Dark One through the use of role-playing games. And John is here to help you. That's right. And I was always really more into the art than into the actual game. And that remains true. And that's what attracted me to this game in the first place, because it's such an art project. And so this the book that I'm putting out is really mostly about the art. And I got to say um, to my listeners, you want to check out John's artwork. You really do. John has a style that among everything else, I personally feel technically proficient, good artist. Absolutely. Who cares? His stuff is fun to look at. You look at John's stuff and you are entertained. You are amused. Even just when he's sketching urban environments, there's this specific feel to it that is just so fun, just so cool. So check out his stuff. Now, as for me, you can find the fittest fat kid you know at all the socials and where it's always at fittest fat kid. Instagram at fittest fat kid. Twitter, at Fittest Fat Kid. The Facebook page, at Fittest Fat Kid. Does this sound familiar yet? There will be a website at some point, but because websites don't fit into my brain in a way that easily is actionable... Ooh, let me guess. Is it FittestFatKid.com? Yes, it is. How did you know? It's my junior Sherlock Holmes detective powers. I see a pattern forming. And of course, if there's any question or comment, anything you'd like to say, if you have a question, if you want to share your story, after all... I'm just a walking bag of uh, scars built around my weight journey, and I can help you through yours. I was wondering how you were going to end that sentence. Convoluted, like. I was just a walking bag of, how does that end? (laughs) With tears, usually with tears. The email address is hi there at fittestfatkid.com. So, (laughs) in the end, it doesn't matter whether you stumble or fall. It doesn't matter whether you don't know how to take the first step forward, all that matters is that you put in the effort, that you hold yourself accountable, but do it with kindness and understanding. For my buddy Johnny Blues It, I'm Bruce, I'm the fittest fat kid you know, and I'll talk to you next week. <laughs>